I challenged myself to be Pokemon Heart Gold using Gold's team from the Pokemon Adventures manga. After completing Nuzlocke's of Red and Blue's teams, Deathless mind you, I thought it would be fitting to take on the next protagonist of the series. Will I be able to complete this run without anyone dying? No. The answer is no. Look at Gold's team. You suck, you suck, you're meh, and you guys are okay. Now look at Lance's team. So let's play a game called Who Will Die? This is gonna be fun. Better than Green's team, I guess. Or Yellow's. Ugh. Oh, also, out of all the Pokemon Gold caught, I can't use Pichu without breeding, and Teddy Ursa is a Soul Silver exclusive. Everyone else is eligible though. As usual, I'll be playing with standard Nuzlocke rules. Let's get started with our first adventure through Johto. This time, our adventure starts in New Bark Town. I name myself Gold and officially start our Pokemon journey. Professor Elm needs our help next door, so I head on over to check it out. It turns out he needs our help to retrieve something from Mr. Pokemon, who is two routes away. It's not all bad though, as Elm gives us a Cyndaquil to navigate through the tall grass. In the manga, things were a little different. Gold was playing billiards at night when his radio signal went out. He went to investigate and found young Sir Joey outside his house. It turns out, he was delivering Pokemon to Professor Elm when a wild Murkrow stole his bag and hid at the top of a tall tree. Gold did one of his signature billiard trick shots and shot a Pokeball up into a tree, sending out Apom to defeat the Murkrow. Apom yanked Gold up with an impromptu pulley system, and Gold did another billiards trick shot with the Pokeball, catching the Murkrow and saving young Sir Joey's bag. Gold decided to help Joey deliver the bag to Elm, but on the way there, a mysterious black tendril stole Gold's bag while they weren't paying attention. Wait, a mysterious black tendril? Could it be? When they got to the lab, Gold meets Silver face to face who just stole a Totodile from Professor Elm. Gold tries to stop him, even doing another awesome trick shot to send out Apom behind Silver's Sneasel to catch him off guard. Welcome to Water Man, Gold would do amazing in Hisui. In their scuffle, Gold borrows Cyndaquil to fight Silver, nicknaming him Expo for the explosive fire on his back. Silver managed to get away, but Expo and Gold stuck together, starting off their new friendship. Shout out to Gold's police sketch, by the way. That is spot on. In our adventures, I arrive at Mr. Pokemon's house and pick up the mystery egg. On the way back, we bump into Silver and take out his Totodile. Just like in the manga, Silver stole his starter from Elm and we're able to provide a police sketch as well. I may have embellished some parts of the drawing, but the police accepted my statement and do absolutely nothing to catch him. Talk about realism. I make my way through the routes and arrive at Violet City. I'll be taking on Faulkner with only my unevolved Expo, so this will be interesting. But before we can challenge him, we have to first clear through Sprout Tower. And unfortunately, I have some bad news. While clearing through the tower, Expo overlevels past a level cap of 13 and evolves into Quilava. I know XP managing can be difficult with only one Pokemon, but there were definitely some avoidable trainers that I could have skipped. <sighs> Back to square one, I guess. I restart my adventure, get my partner Expo again, and catch up to where we were, avoiding all the optional trainer battles and taking out Elder Lee without overleveling. I also get Expo close to level 14 so we can level up during the fight for the extra stats. With everything out of the way, it's time to take on Faulkner. Faulkner leads with Pidgey and I lead with Expo. Pidgey is a two shot with Ember which lets him get off a sand attack. Luckily, our next Ember connects which takes out Pidgey and gives us enough XP to level up. I know one or two stat points doesn't seem like much, but at our low levels it can really change the tides of the battle. Faulkner sends out Pidgeotto next who retaliates with Tackle and Gust. Luckily. With our increased defenses, we're able to tank all the attacks and survive on 7 HP, taking out the Pidgeotto and winning us the battle. That's badge number 1. After the battle, Expo evolves into Quilava. I always liked Quilava's design as a middle stage Pokemon. It's a nice combination of Cyndaquil's flame on its butt and Typhlosion's flame on its neck. Too bad its stats are a copy paste of Charmeleon's. The whole evolution line actually. Did you guys know that? No clue what Game Freak was doing there. Thought we wouldn't notice, huh? Now that we've defeated Faulkner, we can get a few more encounters. First, I get the mystery egg from Professor Elm's aid to hatch our next team member, Togebo the Togepi. In the manga, Gold initially called Togebo Eggy, well, because he's an egg. 
Gold was famously an expert at hatching and raising Pokemon from eggs, but one night, while Gold was sleeping, a wild Gligar stole Pokebo's egg. Gold was sound asleep, but his team sprung into action, chasing down the Gligar to rescue Togebo. In the scuffle, Gligar accidentally cracked the egg, and Togebo popped out. He immediately defended himself, using Double Edge and Metronome to scare off the Gligar. Eventually, Togebo evolves into Togetic and Togekiss, which I plan to do as well in our playthrough. After Togebo hatches, Professor Elm immediately calls us and tells us to talk to him in his lab. I make the long and arduous trek back to Newbark Town for... a Neverstone. Thanks, Elm. You know when your grandma's got Alzheimer's and she just gives you random stuff for your birthday? Like, here, happy birthday, I got you an egg. Someone should perform a wellness check on Elm for giving me this rock. The other encounter we can get is a Poliwag with the Old Rod. I always thought the Old Rod exclusively got Magikarp, but apparently there's a 15% to get a Poliwag here. I catch Polybo and add him to the team. In the manga, Polybo was one of the Pokemon that settled at Gold's house. When Gold's bag was stolen, Polybo's Pokeball was lost and ended up drifting away downstream. Gold found him and added him to the team, and he eventually evolved into Poliwhirl and then into Politoed. There's a really awesome parallel between Gold and Red through Polybo. Initially, he wanted to evolve into a Poliwrath, just like Poly from Red's team. However, while Gold and Silver were exploring the Tin Tower, the building collapsed with our hero still inside. Silver's Croconaw and Polybo tried to fill the area with water so they could swim up and escape, but Polybo just couldn't produce enough water as a Poliwag. He quickly evolved into Poliwhirl, and then into Politoed using a King's Rock, which gave them enough power to save the group. With all our encounters done, I defeat Team Rocket and Slowpoke well, and get ready to challenge Bugsy. I also walked around a bunch with Togebo to increase his friendship in order to evolve him into Togetic. The extra stats and the flying type resist will definitely help with Bugsy. With the team fully maxed out, it's time to take her on. Bugsy leads with Scyther, and I lead with Expo. We land a powerful Ember as Scyther only sets up a focus energy. While a critical hit can be scary, Scyther only has weak quick attacks and U-turn, which we resist. Eventually, Bugsy heals and I have to switch into Togebo. A charm greatly reduces Scyther's damage, and a yawn puts the giant mantis to sleep. Looking back, this wasn't the best strategy since Scyther's crit chance was boosted, and a critical hit would bypass the attack drops. Luckily, Scyther didn't crit, and we're able to take her out with a few extra sensories. With Scyther out of the picture, her remaining Metapod and Kakuna were easily taken care of too. That's badge number 2. With Bugsy defeated, we now have access to Cut, so I easily take out Silver and rescue the two far-fetched in Ilex Forest. By the way, do you guys know the theory that HMs were originally supposed to be like ride Pokemon all the way back in Gen 1? Farfetch would have been for Cut, Lapras for Surf, Diglett for Dig, and so on. I think it's a pretty interesting theory. The strongest piece of evidence for me is Mr. Mime for Flash, since you get the HM for Flash from Professor Oak's aid right next to the guy who trades you Mr. Mime. Either way, it's pretty fun to think about. Further into Ilex Forest, I meet the Headbutt guy who teaches us how to headbutt trees for new encounters. With this, we can get our next team member, Abo the Apom. First, I went to Azalea Town, but this Apom ate up every single Pokeball we threw at him. It's the best way to become stupid again. I don't know. To scream, I want to be monkey again! Luckily, there's another encounter on Route 33, so I catch Abo and add him to the team. In the manga, Abo lived at Gold's house before his Pokemon journey even started. He was the one who took out Murkrow in the first panels of the manga. Eventually, Abo evolved into Apom, which we will be doing too once Abo learns double hit. The manga also gave us this awesome panel of Super Monkey Ball Apom when Gold was cheating at billiards. So cute! With all our encounters done, I head through the routes and arrive at Goldenrod City. On the way there, we stop by the daycare and get Lyra's phone number. Before challenging Whitney, I head north to the National Park to get another encounter, Sunbow the Sunkern. I'm pretty disappointed that we have to use Sunflora in this playthrough. Look at its base stats. Truly one of the Pokemon of all time. In the manga, Gold caught Sunkern after seeing how it could jump up and down. He realized that he could put Expo's Pokeball on Sunkern to launch him high up to reach a Skarmory in the sky. Later on in their adventures, while fighting the Masked Man, Sunbow evolves under the direct sunlight and powers up a sunny day, allowing Expo to fire off powerful fire-type attacks to win the battle. That's all the encounters we can get before Whitney, so I work on training up the team. I don't have access to a Sunstone for Sunbow, or a Shiny Stone for Togebo yet, so they'll remain unevolved for this fight. I'll be honest, I'm very nervous for Whitney's Milk Tank. I'm fully prepared to wipe if my strat doesn't work out. 
Whitney leads with Clefairy, and I lead with Abo. We immediately start the battle with our strategy and lower Clefairy's accuracy with Sand Attack. Clefairy uses Metronome and pulls Perish Song. Okay, this definitely cut our strategy short. I immediately switch into Expo as Clefairy only uses Double Slap. I use this opportunity to switch around to Togebo and Sunbow to get everyone a free level up from Clefairy going down. But Whitney's AI understands Perish Song and switches into Mill Tank while I have Sunbow out. Now we're forced to improvise. Mill Tank fires off a powerful stomp and we set up a Leech Seed. Another stomp will definitely knock out Sunbow, so I switch into the tanky Togebo to absorb the attack. Mill Tank's next stomp manages to flinch us, but Leech Seed recovery is keeping us healthy. On the next attack, we dodge the flinch and get off a charm, drastically lowering Mill Tank's attack. The next three stomps barely do any damage, and although we get flinched three times in a row, we end up healing more than Whitney's damage from the Leech Seed. Whitney heals, and out of desperation, she tries to set up one of her infamous rollout sweeps. But at this point, with all the charms we've set up, she's never going to get enough momentum to take us out. Clefairy comes back after Mill Tank goes down, so I use a charm before switching out to Abo to go for Sand Attack strats again. Clefairy uses Metronome and somehow pulls Perish Song again. Whitney's team really doesn't want to win, huh? After messing around for a few turns, Clefairy goes down to its own Perish Song, winning us a third gym badge. Er, not yet. Now we get the badge, after Whitney's done being a baby. Oh, okay, so now you two aren't babies, but are you a baby? Are you a baby? No. Well, you, you didn't give me the badge. That's badge number three. With Whitney defeated, we can get access to the squirt bottle, which lets us get our next encounter, Sudobo the Sudowudo. In the manga, Gold was racing around Goldenrod against Whitney when the two racers encountered a giant tree that neither could get to budge. Wait, is Sudo Widow canonically supposed to be this big? That is terrifying. After a while, Polybo's water gun got the Sudo Widow to move, but in the commotion, a wild Rhydon charged at them and carried Whitney away. In the end, Gold caught the Sudo Widow, used him to defeat the wild Rhydon, and rescued Whitney. I'm not too thrilled about using Sudo Widow, cause this guy sucks. I looked into his move pool and I realized I really needed to start farming hard scales throughout our adventure because his type coverage is kinda bad. I'll have to do that for Togekiss too if I actually want to use useful moves like Air Slash and Aura Sphere. But with Sudowoodo caught, our main team is finally together. At this point, I can access Ekritik City for the next badge, but before we can do that, we have to find Morty in the Burn Tower. We find him exploring the ruins with Yusin, along with Silver for some reason. He challenges us to a battle, which gives us a good opportunity to test out our new team member. Silver leads with Ghastly, and I lead with Expo. Flame Wheel's a two-shot, but Ghastly only wastes a turn using Mean Look. We easily take him out, and Silver sends out Croconaut next. I switch into Togebo while Croconaut only spams Scary Face. I try to encore him into using Scary Face, but he switches to Ice Fang, so I'm forced to switch back into Expo. We get off three smoke screens as Croconaut is locked into Ice Fang. We switch back into Togebo to lower his accuracy with Charm, as Croconaw misses its attacks. With Roost to keep us healthy, we can pivot to Sudobo for his first major battle. A Rock Throw does poor damage, but a second Rock Throw crits and takes Croconaw out. Silver's follow-up Zubat goes down to a single Rock Throw, and his Magnemite goes down to Expo's Flame Wheel, winning us the battle. Before taking on Morty, we need to take care of a few things with the team. First, I level up everyone to the level cap of 25. In that time, Polybow evolves into Poliwhirl. I want to evolve Sunbow into Sunflora, but unfortunately, it's difficult to get a Sunstone at this point. I can get one by winning first place in the bug catching contest, but that requires that I catch a Pokemon there, which defeats the purpose of a Nuzlocke. You can get a Sunstone from the Pokeathlon Dome, but that requires you to get the National Dex first. I still go there to check it out, and look! There's, there's a random Sunstone on the ground. Someone must have dropped it. I use it to evolve Sunbow, and with that, our team is fully maxed out. Let's challenge Morty. Morty leads with Ghastly, and I lead with Togebo. By the way, you see the whole team shaking there? That means defeating Ghastly will let them level up. Super cool feature that they had for this game. Anyway, I switch into Abo as Ghastly fails a spike. A single Shadow Claw is enough to take him out. Pretty convenient that the TM for Shadow Claw is right outside of Ekritik, huh? Haunter comes out next, but it's a clean one-shot too. Morty gets desperate and sends out his ace Gengar, but little does he know, Gengar can easily be cheesed with the normal type Pokemon with a status move. Gengar's two attacking moves are Shadow Ball, which doesn't affect us, and Sucker Punch, which fails if we're using a status move. 
So, in theory, we only need to spam Sand Attack until Gengar runs out of Sucker Punch's 5 PP. It doesn't matter if we're trapped with Mean Look or get put to sleep with Hypnosis. And that's exactly what happens. Abo swiftly takes out the Gengar, and Morty's follow up Haunter too. That was super easy, huh? That's badge number 4. Before heading any further, I help the Kimono Girls and grab the HM for Surf. This will be an amazing move for Polybo, especially when he's a Polytoad. With our newly acquired Surf, we can go past Olivine City and explore Sinewood City. On the way there, we can get another encounter, Kibo the Mantine. In the manga, Kibo rescued Gold when he, Silver, and Crystal were adrift at sea and attacked by Lugia. Boosted by a swarm of Remoraid, Kibo could swim at great speeds to pull Gold out from the ocean and help in the battle against the rampaging Lugia. I'd like to bring Tebo on the team, but I also want to keep the main team together. Since we're taking on Chuck next, I decided that since Sudoba will have a terrible matchup, he'll sit this one out for Tebo to get a chance to shine. I level up the team to the level cap and get ready to challenge Chuck. Chuck leads with Primeape, and I lead with Tebo. Primeape uses Leer, and Tebo uses Wing Attack, which does just under half. Primeape then goes for Rock Slide, and with our defense lowered from Leer, it does heavy damage. Unfortunately, Tebo flinches, so I'm forced to switch into Polybo to tank another Rock Slide. A single Surf is enough to take Primeape out, which brings out Chuck's Polyrath. Polyrath tries to go for a Focus Punch, but we stop his attack with a Body Slam, which also gets a Lucky Paralysis. Polyrath tries again, but we go for another Body Slam to stop him. Eventually, he switches to Hypnosis, which now puts us at risk to a powerful Focus Punch. I switch into Sunbow, who barely tanks the attack. A powerful stab Mega Drain is enough to heal back a lot of our HP as Polyrath gets paralyzed. Another Mega Drain takes him out, which wins us the battle. That's badge number 5. I know the next gym leader people usually face is Jasmine, but the next gym leader in order of level caps is Price, so we head over to Mahogany Town. But in order to fight him, we need to first clear through the Lake of Rage as well as the Rocket Headquarters. In that time, Abel learns Double Hit and evolves into Ambipom. I also backtrack to Slowpoke Well to get the King's Rock to evolve Polybo into Politoed. With our team maxed out, it's time to take on Price. Price leads with Seal, and I lead with Sunbow. Shout out to Price, the Ice type gym leader who uses a pure water type Seal. No Jinx or Bellybird or Lapras or Sneasel. I mean, the man loves Seals, what can I say? Seal only sets up Hail, and Sunbow easily takes him out with a single Mega Drain. Dugong comes out next, who retaliates with a super effective Aurora Beam. Mega Drain does huge damage, but I switch it to Sudobo to play around a potential critical hit. Yugong decides to go for Rest instead, so it would have been an easy KO with Mega Drain if we stayed in. A single Low Kick is enough to take him out, which brings out Price's last Pokemon, his Ace Piloswine. I stay in to get some damage with Rock Slide, but Piloswine does too much damage with Mud Bomb, and Rock Slide also misses. I switch into Polybo, who dodges the incoming Mud Bomb and one-shots the Piloswine with Surf, winning us the battle and our 6th Gym Badge. Before we do anything else, the next level cap is only one level above Price, that being Jasmine at level 35. So, I make my way back to Olivine City to deliver the secret potion to Amphi so we can take her on. Jasmine leads with Magnemite, and I lead with Expo. A flamethrower from the Goldenrod game corner easily one-shots him, which brings out Steelix. Steelix is running Rock Throw, so I play it safe and switch into Sunbow to set up a Leech Seed. An Iron Tail does roughly half, but after a Mega Drain, we're sitting very comfortably. Another Iron Tail brings us a red HP, but the Leech Seed and Mega Drain recovery is keeping us healthy. I know Jasmine will heal, so I stay in and continue to slowly whittle away at Steelix's high HP. Eventually, Sunbow is able to take out the giant Land Snake, with the help of a few misses with Iron Tail. Her second Magnemite comes out next, but Expo easily cleans up, winning us a 7th Gym Badge. With Jasmine defeated, that unlocks our next encounters. Even though we have all our main team members, plus Tebow, I wanted to catch a few more Pokemon for completion's sake. First, I head back to Sinewood City to head to the Safari Zone. That's where the infamous Onyx and Cloyster couple is by the way. Hope I wasn't interrupting anything. In the Safari Zone, I catch a Murkrow in the Swamp Biome, the same Murkrow from the beginning of the video when Youngster Joey's bag was stolen. Wow, full circle. Gold never uses him in battle, but I catch him anyway and name him... Murbo. Yeah, Murbo. Awesome nickname, Gold. Also, on the way back from the Safari Zone, I catch a Chincho. In the manga, while looking for Polybo, Gold caught a bunch of Chincho to prevent them from electrocuting him. I won't be using him, but I wanted to catch him for completion. I will name you... Chinbo. Yeah, Chinbo. Welcome, Chinbo. 
Before we can challenge Claire and collect our final badge, we have to clear through a disturbance at Goldenrod City. First, we get some Team Rocket Drip in order to sneak into the radio tower undetected. This part of the story is so cool. I'm kinda sad that you can only dress as a rocket grunt for this short section. While clearing through the tower, Expo evolves into Typhlosion. With the tower secured, we can unlock Team Rocket's secret base in the underground. But before we can go further, we're challenged again by our rival Silver. Sudobo takes out Golbat, Hollybo takes out Feraligator, Magnemite, and Haunter, and Expo takes out Sneasel. Not a difficult fight at all. With all the rocket grunts cleared, we can rescue the director and finish off Archer. Archer successfully put out a message to search for Giovanni, but obviously that didn't work. Archer was like, why do chips get stale? And Giovanni heard that and was like, dog, dog don't care. By the way, the fight against Archer was so easy. Hollybo swept through all three of his Pokemon. At this point, the Rage Candy Bar guy finally goes home so we can head to Blackthorn City. Maybe he thought the Team Rocket message was for him. Either way, this opens up the next route, which lets us get our final encounter, a Remoraid. In the manga, Gold caught a bunch of Remoraid to boost Tebow's flying and surfing. Using Water Gun, Remoraid could redirect Tebow and also target enemies while airborne. I'll only be catching one, and I name her... Remobo. Probably the most normal nickname out of everyone here. Shout out to Murbo and Chinbo. Man, if I could catch Ho-Ho, I could call him Hobo. What a missed opportunity. With all our encounters done, we make our way through Ice Path, pick up the horribly placed HM for Waterfall, and arrive at Blackthorn City. I take out the gym trainers to level up the team to the level cap and get ready to challenge Claire. In this time, I head back to the Pokeathlon Dome and... Oh wow! A random shiny stone on the ground. It's my lucky day! I use the shiny stone to evolve Togebo into Togekiss, and with the team maxed out, it's time to take out Claire. Claire leads with Gyarados, and I lead with Sudobo. Gyarados fires off a Dragon Rage, and we retaliate with a powerful Rock Slide. I know Claire will probably heal at this range, so I decide to go for another Rock Slide. Gyarados is in the red again, and I wasn't sure if Claire had two potions, so I figured I'd tank a Dragon Rage and go for a Rock Slide instead of a Sucker Punch. Gyarados goes down, and Claire immediately sends out her Ace Kingdra, so I switch into Polybo. We tank a Dragon Pulse and get hit with a Smoke Screen, but Polybo still connects with an Ice Beam, and even gets a 10% Freeze. Kingdra stays frozen, and a few more Ice Beams easily takes out her Ace. Dragonair comes out next, but she outspeeds and paralyzes us before we can get an attack off. With the Paralysis and the Smoke Screen from earlier, we miss our next two Ice Beams and are forced to switch. I guess all our luck ran out with that Freeze earlier. I send out Togebo, and... oh yeah. We're not a Fairy type yet, so we have to tank a Soft Dragon Pulse. I go for a Serene Grace boosted headbutt, but we don't get the 60% flinch and instead get paralyzed by a Thunder Wave. Now we can outspeed for our flinch strats, but I still go for a headbutt for the damage. Dragonair does go for another Dragon Pulse, and Togebo gets paralyzed. Twice, actually. Our luck is literally negative. Eventually, we manage to get a few roosts in and take out the Dragonair with headbutts. Claire sends out her last Pokemon, <sighs> another Dragonair. Eventually, our luck runs out and we switch into Abo, who tanks a Dragon Pulse and takes out the Dragonair with a Strength, winning us our 8th Gym Badge. Well, technically she refuses to give it to us, but we do all the Dragon's Cave stuff and get the badge as usual. That's badge number 8. Before we can head to the Elite Four, we first have to take care of the Ho-Oh storyline. I backtrack to Ecruteak City and take out all the Kimono Girls before climbing Bell Tower to challenge Ho-Oh. With our powerful Master Ball, this battle shouldn't be too difficult. oh Sudobo's got it. The Kimono Girls weren't too happy about that. If that is what you believe, we will not try to convince you otherwise. Yeah, okay, whatever bro. I ain't reading all that. Happy for you, or sorry that happened, or whatever. With Ho-Oh taken care of, it's finally time to take our first steps into Kanto and make our way to the Elite Four. But while heading through Victory Road, Silver stops us while our team is barely hanging on. He leads with Sneasel, and I'm forced to send out Abo who's only at half HP. But in reality, all this battle shows is a terrible gap of levels in the game. At a 12 level advantage, a super effective U-turn cleanly one-shot Sneasel. Expo takes out Magneton, Abo takes out Feraligator, Polybo takes out Golbat and Haunter, and Togebo takes out Kadabra. That was definitely one of the most one-sided battles ever. And with that, we finally made it to the Pokemon League. Before we go any further, I prepare the team for our upcoming challenge. With all our heart scales we've collected from smashing rocks throughout our adventure, I teach the team their best moves from the Move Tutor in Blackthorn City. I also pick up a few items from the Goldenrod department store. Here's a quick rundown of the team. Polybo is an all-out special attacker with choice specs, Abo is a fast pivoter with U-turn and Silt Scarf plus stab boosted returns, Expo is a charcoal boosted nuke with flamethrower and blast burn, Sudobo is a well-rounded physical attacker, 
Sunbow is a bulky Leech Seed plus Protect Staller, and Togebo is a fast Air Slash Flincher with its Serene Grace. Let's do this. First up is Will. He leads with Zatu, and I lead with Polybo. Zatu steals our attack with me first, but luckily it's only an Ice Beam, which we easily resist. Zatu, however, can't handle our attack, and goes down to a single Ice Beam. Jinx comes out next, so I switch into Expo. We get hit with a decent Psychic, but Expo tanks it and retaliates with a Flamethrower, taking her out. Will sends out Slowbro next, so I switch into Sunbow, as Slowbro only sets up Curse. Eventually, we take out the Slowbro with the Petal Dance, but now we're locked in as Will sends out his second Zatu. He does a lot of damage with Aerial Ace, but even our resisted Petal Dances are doing pretty good damage. Eventually, our dance ends, so I quickly switch into Sudobo to take out the Zatu with a Sucker Punch. Will's last Pokemon is Executor, so I send out Togebo, who cleanly one-shots the Giant Tree with an Air Slash. That's one down, three to go. Next up is Koga, who I guess got a promotion from his Gym Leader role. Congrats, man! He leads with Ariados, and I lead with Togebo. An Air Slash easily takes him out, which brings out Koga's Fortress. All he manages to do is set up a layer of Toxic Spikes, but we abuse his low special defense to take him out too. Muk comes out next, so I switch into Sudobo, who gets poisoned by the Toxic Spikes. Muk sets up two Minimizes, but we attack through the evasion and one-shot him. Next is Venomoth, but a single Rock Slide takes him out too. Finally is his Ace Crobat, but a single Rock Slide takes him out as well, winning us a second Elite Four battle. Speaking of second Elite Four members, next up is Bruno. Nice to see another familiar face. Bruno leads with Hitmontop, and I lead with Togebo. With our Choice Scarf, we easily outspeed Hitmontop, and... Oh, he has Quick Attack. It's okay, we tank it and take him out with an Air Slash. Next up is Hitmonchan. Now we can finally enact our plan and outspeed to one-shot him with an Air Slash. Bruno sends out Onyx next, so I switch into Polybo as Onyx misses a Rock Slide. Polybo then outspeeds and lands a 4 times super effective Surf, which easily one-shots the Land Snake. Bruno sends out Machamp, but we stay in and continue to fire off powerful Surfs. Machamp can tank it though, and dishes back a huge amount of damage with the critical hit Cross Chop. That was close, but we outspeed on the next turn and take out the Machamp with another Surf. Bruno sends out his final team member, his Hitmonlee, so I switch into Togebo to outspeed and take him out with an Air Slash, winning us a third Elite Four battle. Last up is Karen. She leads with Umbreon, so I lead with Sunbow. I know that Umbreon will be really bulky, so I decided to go for my Leech Seed and Protect Strats. With a few Sludge Bombs in between, we manage to outstall the Umbreon and win the 1v1. In the process, a Sludge Bomb manages to poison Umbreon, and her Synchronize sinks the poison onto us. By the time Murkrow comes out, I have to switch into Expo to take out the Crow with the boosted Flamethrower. This brings out Houndoom, who manages to dodge our Focus Blast while she sets up a Nasty Plot. I wonder what she's plotting, maybe plans to like and subscribe to my channel. That would be quite devilish. Regardless, the next Focus Blast connects, which cleanly one-shots Houndoom. Gengar comes out next, who almost gets one-shot by a Flamethrower. She only goes for Spite, which I guess did something? I lost 4 PP, I really don't know how I can continue on with this battle. To save some Flamethrower PP, we switch to Hidden Power Psychic, which takes out the Gengar. Karen sends a Vile Plume, and I end the battle with a Bang, one-shotting her with the Boosted Blast Burn, winning us the final Elite Four battle. Finally, it's time to take on the Dragon Master himself. Lance was by our side throughout our adventure, so it'll be interesting to actually take him on. I'm a little intimidated, especially after seeing him brutally murder a man with his Dragonite's Hyper Beam. As I mentioned in the intro, it'll be a tough battle. I fully expect to lose some of our team members, but let's hope for the best. Lance leads with his Gyarados, and I lead with Togebo. Our flinch strats immediately work, as Togebo flinches Gyarados twice in a row. Lance heals, and we continue to fire off powerful air slashes. Eventually, Lance realizes it's pointless and switches to Aerodactyl to tank the attack. I switch into Sudobo as Aerodactyl only misses a Rock Slide. The next one connects though, as ours misses. On the next turn, his Rock Slide misses while ours lands, taking Aerodactyl out. That was an odd flip-flop of attacks. Gyarados comes back out, but I know that none of my Pokemon deal with him well. He's running Ice Fang, so I can't switch Sunbow or Togebo in as easily. I ran the damage calcs, and I know that we live a waterfall as long as Gyarados doesn't crit. Sudobo stays in, plants himself like the real tree that he is, and... We tank the attack. We also dodge the flinch, which lets us retaliate with the rock slide, taking out the Leviathan. Dragonite comes out next, and this is where the real battle begins. No one can withstand the strength of Dragonite's stab dragon rush. 
Even Togebo will go down to a few Dragon Rushes if we're not lucky with the flinches. I don't have many options here, so some sacrifices will be needed for a ragtag team of misfits to take on some of the most powerful Pokemon from Kanto. First, I switch into Sunbow, arguably my weakest team member. Sunbow knows what's coming, and she's not going down without a fight. Dragonite's first Dragon Rush connects, dealing heavy damage. On the next turn, we land a Leech Seed while Sunbow dodges the second Dragon Rush. With the Leech Seed set up, Sunbow can permanently help her friends even when she's off the field. A quick Protect can get us a little more HP as we sap another notch off Dragonite's gargantuan health. With our own clock running out, we switch into Sudobo as Dragonite misses another Dragon Rush. Now, we've got our back against the wall. With no more switches and no more stalling with Protect, there's only one way out. Sudobo stares Dragonite in the eye as he fires off a Sucker Punch, outspeeding with the priority, but Dragonite stares back, connecting with a powerful Thunder and taking out our first team member. It's a shame that Sudobo can never make his dream come true and eventually become truly Wudo in the Paldea region, but I hope that he enjoyed our short time together in our adventures through Johto. Rest easy, my friend. Togebo comes out, and after Sunbo's Leech Seed and Sudobo's Sucker Punch, we can outspeed and take out the Dragonite with a single Air Slash. Lance sends out another Dragonite, but this time, he avoids the flinch and paralyzes us, effectively ending our flinch strats. A follow-up Blizzard does heavy damage, but we manage to attack through the Paralysis and connect with another Air Slash, taking out Dragonite. You see why I didn't switch into Togebo earlier? There was just absolutely no way we could solo both Dragonites, especially when Lance still has his Ace Dragonite left. And this Dragonite has Outrage. There's no way anyone can tank an Outrage, let alone two Outrages when he inevitably outspeeds the next turn. Togebo looks back at our team and nods. If we're gonna make it to red and have even a fighting chance, someone will have to make a sacrifice for the team. Sunbow nods back and steps up, knowing exactly what will happen when she comes out of her Pokeball. She stares directly at Dragonite as he fires off an Outrage, completely obliterating Sunbow's remaining HP. Although she wasn't the most powerful Pokemon, she certainly made her impact on the team throughout our adventures. I hope somewhere, Sudobo and Sunbow can share a warm grassy meadow, our big tree and our big sunflower enjoying the beautiful nature together. With Sunbow sacrifice, we're able to safely bring in Polybow. I ran the calcs earlier and I know that we can tank an outrage as long as we don't get crit. Our entire plan hinges on this. Both our team members sacrifices depend on this. Dragonite uses outrage and Polybow tanks it. We fire back with the 4 times super effective ice beam, one shotting him and taking out Lance's final dragon. Well, almost final. Lance sends out his final Pokemon, his Charizard. I switch into Expo to chip away at his HP with the flamethrower, but his air slashes prove to be too powerful. I swap out into Abo, who tanks the Dragon Claw, and we finish him off with the return, winning us the champion battle and the run. And with that, our run does not come to an end. With Kanto unlocked, we have a new challenge of 8 more gyms before us. This section isn't too difficult. I add Tebow and Murbo to the team, and easily take out all the Kanto gym leaders. Oh, also, sometime in our journey, we got the Pokerus. Coronavirus! Coronavirus! I'm telling you, it's real! It'll help our Eevee training a little, but not too much at this point in the game. With all gym challenges cleared and the team leveled up to match Red's Ace Pikachu at level 88, we head through Mount Silver for our final battle. Our team is fully ready to take on this monstrous challenge, even prepared to sacrifice some people if needed. Red has a pretty balanced team, and with his levels in the 80s, it'll be a difficult challenge. I gave Murbo a lax incense to boost his evasion, and juiced up his speed so he could get off a fast attract, forgetting that all of Red's team are male Pokemon. Why are you gay? Who says I'm gay? You are gay. Either way, he's here to revenge kill with Sucker Punch, or sacrifice himself as needed. I made Tebow a bulky special defense tank with leftovers too. Everyone else is pretty much the same. Here's a quick preview of the team. Let's do this. I climb up Mount Silver and find our silent protagonist standing there. Red has only been a legend at this point, but we've managed to track him down and challenge him to a battle. Without returning a word, Red lowers his head and accepts, sending out Pikachu and we send out Abo. With our max speed and full friendship, Abo outspeeds and fires off a stab, silk scarf boosted return, one-shotting Red's partner in crime. Red sends out Blastoise next, and we stay in and deal a huge chunk of damage with another return. Blastoise retaliates with a 100% accurate Blizzard, taking out about half our HP. I wasn't sure if Red heals at this range, so I opt to stay in and use another return, which pays off, taking out Blastoise. Snorlax is up next, and I know he's running Giga Impact. 
With no one to safely switch into, I know it's coming for our team. Murbo, as the newest member of the group, is ready to step up and give his life so we can win. But Abo knows what's coming as well. After all, he and Murbo go way back, back to when Gold first started his journey. We stay in and land a critical hit return. Snorlax falls and Abo lives to see another day. Red sends out Lapras next, and now Abo knows it's time. We deal a huge amount of damage with return, but Lapras retaliates with the blizzard, taking out our beloved monkey. I'll be honest, this one's definitely on me. I could have very safely selected U-turn and switched into Polybo to resist the blizzard. Maybe I wanted to preserve his health for Red's Charizard, but I'm not really sure. Why didn't I sacrifice Murbo? I don't know. I send out Polybo and take out the Lapras with a Focus Blast. Venusaur comes out next, so I switch into Expo to tank the Giga Drain. At our current HP range, an Eruption easily one-shots Venusaur, which brings out Red's final Pokemon, his Charizard. First, I switch into Tebow to tank any special attack he might throw at us. We tank his Air Slash, as well as his follow-up Flare Blitz, and retaliate with the hard-hitting Surf. On the next turn, Red uses a full restore, and we deal a huge amount of damage with Surf again. The turn after that, however, Tebow has had enough of these silly games. He gathers all of his energy together for Sudobo, for Sunbow, and for Abo because I'm an idiot, and lands a critical hit Surf, taking out the Charizard and winning us the battle. And with that, we've done it. Our ragtag team of misfits did it, beating 16 gym leaders, the Elite Four, and Champion Red himself. And even though not everyone made it through, some of it, I'll admit, was my fault, we were able to complete the Nuzlocke and make it through to the other side. Overall, this challenge wasn't too bad. I think the big struggle with these Nuzlocks will be beating Faulkner with only your starter, but luckily we were able to pull through with Expo. At the time this video is live, I'll have a community poll up for you guys to decide what team you'd like to see next. I'm deciding between Green, whose team sucks, Yellow, whose team also sucks, Silver, whose team is pretty stacked, and Crystal, whose team is pretty decent as well. I'm not very worried for Green or Yellow, since the worst teams always bring out the most creative strategies, so let me know what you guys would be interested in. I think it'd be pretty fun to steal Lance's Dragonite too. And hey, if you've made it this far, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. I had a little gap between my last video, so I really appreciate you guys for being here. I spent my last spring break with my family, so I couldn't work on this video as much as I wanted. I put up some fun polls in the meantime, and I plan to keep them going because it's pretty fun to see everyone's opinion. I was surprised that you guys liked following Pokemon over Mega Evolutions. Also, tell me what you guys would like to see for future videos, and I'll be sure to read each comment. Until next time, this has been Magnus. I'll catch you guys later.